So I'm just gonna go briefly over some updates, um, talk about our advisory board meeting that we had and share some thoughts on that with you guys. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Max and Isaac who are gonna give our first soft pitch of the semester, which is really exciting. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so Haley's going to start us off with some ESG news. I'm going to give a quick portfolio update, um, talk about some of the strategy updates that we have in light of the advisory board meeting, um, give you some reminders, and then again, turn it over to Max and Isaac. So Haley, I'm going to give it over to you to talk about some ESG news. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just some things that kind of come up in the last actually two days. Uh, the Financial Times actually put out a um, article super interesting. I have it linked in the um, slides that you can access on the team site. But the article basically talks about the uh, how ESG could be part of the answer to human rights crises around the world. So um, essentially what they talked about was a few events, uh, mainly the one by uh, Unilever. Essentially uh, what happened was Unilever came in and bought a company and Unilever has pretty strong ESG principles. Um, and it essentially led to, over time, improve conditions and help within the areas that um, needed them. They provided some uh, water issues. They helped with a bunch of housing problems uh, in the areas provided. It's a super interesting article. Um, it talks about kind of how the importance of ESG issues becoming um, super relevant uh, within these areas um, that are um, more developing countries, um, especially when the companies coming in um, have strong ESG principles and kind of strong governance in general which is awesome. Um, the Wall Street Journal reports about uh, the kind of this new type of bond, which is sustainability linked. It's not a green bond, it's sustainability linked. This essentially is um, a different type of uh, sustainable bond that um, has a little bit less restrictions than a green bond. The projects are a little bit less. Um, you don't you know, guarantee that a sustainable project will pay you back. Um, there's a lot less administrative costs just because they have to be a little bit uh, less restricted to how they do, how they pay back the bond. Um, and, uh, you know, this is kind of making ESG sustainability linked bonds more available to uh, kind of companies that haven't been able to put them out in the past. It's also great to note that, or not great, I'd say, but uh, important to note that these bonds are uh, slightly less ESG focused than um, a green bond um, has been in the past. Thanks, Haley. Yep. Um, so quick portfolio update. So this isn't as of today. This is as of September 30th. Um, but we're going to start doing this every week. And we're also going to start putting them in the teams and the general posts. So just because we want to keep you guys up to date on how the portfolio is doing, what's going on with it. Um, as you can see, we are trailing our benchmark a little bit um, since inception and the past like couple months, year, any way you look at it. <laughs> Um, but that's because largely because we had a very large cash, cash position, especially over the summer, we got stopped out of a lot of things. Um, we are kind of required to have a, a pretty strict um, stop loss ratio just due to the investment committee and on um, Bentley standards since we're not like technically active over the summer. Um, so that was kind of why, but lately we've been doing a lot better. Um, and I think especially as of this week, like the markets have been really high. So I'm sure our portfolio value went up but we just uploaded our portfolio into Bloomberg. So previously we like manually had a dashboard created in Excel and it was really difficult to keep up to date with what was going on. Um, and we have to kind of wait for our weekly updates from um, this professional, Allison, who like works in the financial office for Bentley. Um, but after this week, we finally up to uploaded it into Bloomberg. So we'll have a lot better reporting metrics and, and things in kind of real time. So again, we're gonna start sending those out so you guys can look at that in more depth um, and actually look at like what's going on, but just in the picture, I know it's like really hard to see in the top, but the blue is our main ETF that we're in, which is the new bean ESG large cap. Um, the yellow is our benchmark, the Russell 3000, orange is waste management, and green is next era. Um, so if you go on the next slide, just to remind you guys, these are our, this is what like consists of our advisory board, and we had a meeting with them. Um, Sasha, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you guys have access to that meeting in the YouTube links. Is that right, Sasha? I'm to analysts, but I can easily upload it under the general channel. Okay. 
Yeah, so in the in the general um, channel under documents, there's a YouTube links document and we can put the link to the advisory board meeting if you guys are interested or you want to watch it. Um, we kind of presented to them what we've been working on and they gave us a bunch of feedback. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of go into the big changes we made due to their feedback and then um, yeah, explain that a little bit more. So on the next slide, I'm going to talk about our ETFs. So because we are only in um, two stocks right now, we, because we got stopped out of so many things um, and because we haven't, again, over the summer and we haven't had that many pitches yet, um, we decided to diversify our ETFs a little bit. Haley, if you could just, okay, yeah, thanks. Did everyone else see the slide or? No, that's my fault, but it's, Okay, no, no worries. <laughs> totally just broken. Oh. It's okay. Um, well, anyway, I could just talk about it while we're waiting for the slide to come up. But um, so originally we were in um, Susel. That was our ETF. And then we sold out of it completely. And then we went into NULG. Um, but now as of this week, we just put trades in to be 40% in NULG, which is a 100% U.S. large cap um, sustainable ETF. And then we decided to go 40% into SDG. And SDG is a lot different. It has about a 70% international, 70% um, international exposure, which therefore like 70 times 40, whatever, gives us like a 20 something percent international exposure, um, which is really great in terms of Everything going on with the elections, um, the advisory board is saying, you know, the market's going to be very volatile. We should have a little bit more of international exposure. So that's kind of how we responded to that. And then the other ETF that we're now in 10% is um, the NACP, which is the ETF by the NAACP, um, large cap US, 100% US, um, and it's tracking the Morningstar Minority Empowerment Index. Um, and the other ETF that's listed on there is ESML. We ended up not, we were, we wanted to have some small cap exposure. Um, so we were thinking about that, but last minute decision, we kind of just said small cap is very, is underperforming. Um, we don't really think it's necessary anymore. So we're not doing that. But that is on our radar. Um, so you could definitely check that out if you want to do a little bit more research into the ETFs that we're in. Um, but obviously the end goal is to not be in any ETFs and to have like a complete um, stocks. So um, we're aiming to have 20 companies in the portfolio by the end of next year, um, or the end of next semester, I guess you'd say. So April-ish, April, May of 2021. So if you go on the next slide, um, the one before that actually, yeah. So the ESG profile updates. Um, so I know some of you might have not been in the first meeting, but we did go over kind of the lowest criteria to get into so every single company no matter what sector it's in like this is what they have to um meet to even enter the portfolio so we did make a few changes here um and we kind of made changes also to the titles of them so in terms of the e we're focusing on decarbonization and we're using msci scores the carbon emissions management and the climate change vulnerability um, and it's just more broad that way, instead of just focusing on like greenhouse gases or just focusing on carbon, the climate change vulnerability um, gives us more of kind of a broad um, rating for that. And then for social, we change it to social justice. Um, so it must not violate the United um, Nations Global Compact. And again, we kind of talked about that. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But um, there's a lot of information on it in the general um, channel. And then there's also a racial exclusion list that was that um, came out. So we're also not allowing um, any companies that are on that list to be part of the fund now. And then lastly, um, for governance, what we did, we made a few changes there. We kept the 30% woman and BIPOC on the board. Um, we we're saying that it can be complemented by C-suite, but we also added the ISS score. So that's something on Bloomberg um, that basically just rates like in general, kind of a broad governance rating. Um, the last thing that we changed, I think we talked about this a little bit last um, presentation, is that in order to enter the fund, you now have to have a triple B plus rating on MSCI. So it used to be double B, but when we actually did, looked at the distribution of it, um, triple B is the top 50% quartile of companies, whereas double B was like 
including 70 something percent, which we didn't think was strict enough um, for a thematic and, and ESG um, sustainable fund. So those are the updates, um, more so honestly for the analysts, but obviously we just wanna make you guys aware of that and so that you know um, overall the entire portfolio will um, follow these guidelines. Um, on the next slide, so the ESG sector themes, for the most part, stay the same. So the top is what they were before the advisory board meeting. And then if you look on the bottom, um, we had a lot of discussions with them. And um, we ended up changing alternative food for consumers to ag tech and sustainable agriculture. Um, for healthcare, we changed safe and fairly priced products to access to healthcare. And for IT, um, we just made that one a little broader. I mean, it's like generally the same thing, but we changed data collection and security theme to cybersecurity. Um, and then that's really all I have for the updates from the advisory board. Um, overall, they're, they think we're doing a great job. They're really excited to get some of our stock pitches in so we can get more companies into the fund. Um, but overall, like it went very well. And again, feel free to watch it. They gave a lot more insight too. Um, and they're again, amazing industry professionals. They have so much knowledge to give. So it's definitely um, worth your time. So in terms of where we're heading, um, I mentioned this before, but we have a goal of 20 individual stocks um, to be in the portfolio by April. We uploaded our portfolio into Bloomberg. Um, we're hoping to have an ESG panel event towards the end of October um, with kind of industry professionals, but then we're also hoping to have an impact panel, which is a little bit different um, with more so like other organizations like the sustainability um, office at Bentley and things like that. Um, more information is to come. There'll be flyers, there'll be other things, but we just wanted to kind of keep that in the back of your head, some events that we're having soon. And um, I'm gonna show you the calendar in a second, but just so that you know, next week um, we have IT pitching Spotify and we have the healthcare sector pitching um, Medtronic. So this is the lovely calendar that Haley made, kudos to her. Um, <laughs> so again, healthcare and tech are pick, pitching October 13th. The following week we have materials, um, they're pitching Ecolab. And then the week after that, we're having consumers and financials pitch. Um, I know financials is pitching Prologis. Um, and then these are the um, meeting times. So just in case anyone was confused or couldn't figure out the teams, that, oh, that's another thing I wanna say. So if, does everyone like, okay with teams and how the group meeting the sector meetings are going you know you could just go into their channel when they have the meetings there will be like a microsoft teams meeting on there they'll post updates um honestly can everyone like if if someone isn't getting that or having any issues or not understanding like how to go to the sector meetings would you mind just raising your hand but if everyone's good, that's great. But I just want to make sure because I know like the teams is a whole new thing. It can be a little confusing. No. Okay. Well, if anyone has any issues and just doesn't want to raise their hand, just feel free to email us. Um, actually, someone emailed me earlier today about it, but okay. Awesome. Um, so on the next slide, I'm just going to introduce Max and Isaac, um, and then I'll hand it over to them to pitch Brookfield. So um, both Isaac and Max are juniors. Um, they have some fun facts on here. So I'm gonna like, I hope I don't embarrass them, but <laughs> Isaac has climbed five tallest mountains in Maine and Max surfs a few days a week all year round. So that's pretty cool. Um, and Isaac is a finance major with a concentration in sustainable investing and Max is a CFA major. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to them if no one has any questions or anything and um after that so sasha is going to send out a um stock pitch voting google form it's very easy um you just have to state you know whether or not you want want it to be in the fund and a few reasons why um we're going to give you guys till sunday to complete that in case you want to do your own research look up some stuff ask them questions they're going to be available to you um, not only can you ask questions after this presentation, but if you think of more things throughout the week, um, please feel free to do so. And, and that's the last thing I would say is like during the presentation, just write things down. Um, it's really important that you guys ask questions and 
um, you know, kind of questioning all their assumptions and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, that being said, um, Max, Isaac, I'm not sure which one of you is going to share yours, but feel free to take it over. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Elise. Um, I just need, I'm not sure if I have permission yet to share. Yes, you do. Everybody has it. All right, cool. All right. All right let me open this real quick here. All right, uh, can everybody see that? Awesome. Yep. All right, so the energy utilities and infrastructure sector today, we are pitching Brookfield Renewable. Um, the goal of our sector, um, hold on, I got a little thing covering my thing. Uh, so the goal of our sector basically is to build a portfolio of stocks that offers a high potential for environmental and social good with outsized returns. Um, the companies that we're looking at as a sector um, are committed to sustainable operations and more importantly, a sustainable future. We're looking at um, things from transportation to water to renewable energy, uh, et cetera. Um, and today's pitch will be a diversified portfolio of renewable energy. All right, uh, this is myself, Max. I think Elise already introduced myself and Isaac and Isaac will take us off with the company overview. Yep. So to jump right into it, to explain a little bit about Brookfield, uh, Brookfield Renewable Partners is a globally diversified multi-technology owner and operator of renewable power assets. They operate with the business model to utilize global reach to acquire and develop high quality renewable power assets that they deem to be below intrinsic value. They finance them on the long term with uh, low risk and investment grade basis. Uh, through a conservative financing uh, strategy, which is partly uh, debt and partly equity. And then they attempt to optimize cash flow by applying their operating expertise to enhance value. And the main way they create revenue is by maintaining a highly stable, predictable cash flow. As I mentioned, they enter into long term contracts where they can predict cash flow out from uh, 15 to 30 years. So they have a pretty predictable business model. Uh, they continue to be focused on maintaining highly diversified investment grade customer base. They have over 600 customers across the world, mostly in North America, South America, Asia, and Europe. And at the end of 2017, they owned over 200 hydroelectric plants, 100 wind farms, and over 550 solar facilities and four storage facilities. And to give a brief overview of um, the stock, it's currently trading at about $53 with a 52 week range of 30 to 57. Um, they have an EV to EBITDA multiple of 17, which is roughly around the industry average. They have a beta of 0.65, so they're a bit less volatile than the market as a whole. And they have a relatively high dividend yield of 3.12%. And yesterday they actually named a new CEO, Connor Teske, he uh, has been with the company since 2012 and, and uh, acted as a member of the private equity group, as well as manager of, managing partner of renewable power and then chief investment officer. And they really focus on ESG efforts such as decarbonization of the planet, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, really conduct climate change risk assessments. They're partnered and foster many relationships with different organizations around the world, focused on economic development, education, and health all through their environmental projects. Next slide. Hold up here, my bad. So to give a brief overview of the ESG factors, catalysts, and risks that we looked at, uh, some of the ESG factors that we considered were, they're currently one of the, the largest issuers of green bonds globally. Uh, so they offer green bonds on a, a project basis, which allow investors to, to invest directly in specific projects. Uh, their carbon footprint is also one of the lowest in the entire industry. Uh, they currently had generate of 57 terawatt hours of renewable energy, 
which avoids approximately 27 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year. Uh, and then to go into some catalysts, this year they partnered with Plug Power, which is a leading provider of hydrogen en engines, and they entered an agreement to source 100% of Plug's power renewable energy. So Plug Power could actually build one of North America's first industrial scale green hydrogen production plants. And this is an industry that's expected to reach 2.5 trillion by 2050. Another sizable acquisition they had was in the fourth quarter, they um, acquired a 1.2 gigawatt solar development portfolio in Brazil. This is currently one of the largest uh, solar portfolios in the entire world. And the third catalyst is the potential for uh, Biden to win the presidency. Um, as we know, Biden has committed to uh, a clean electric uh, economy and to achieve carbon pollution free power sector by 2035 and net zero emissions by 2050. This as a whole would have a huge impact on the renewable, um, renewable energy industry and really project it forward over the next couple of years. And some risks that uh, Brookfield faces is they're impacted by exposure to movements in the market price of energy because they're pure play energy. So they're really impacted when uh, over the long term energy prices fluctuate. However, the way that they mitigate against this is by entering into long term contracts. Currently, their average contract is 15 years, so that that really mitigates the potential for um, them to be negatively affected by short term changes in energy prices. Second risk that they have is returns of projects are largely determined by the interest rate that they can get on financing for them. Uh, this is mitigated by the way that they raise debt. Currently, 90% of their debt is fixed rate with an average rate of 4%. So only 10% is um, an adjustable rate. So they really don't have a huge amount of risk in uh, fluctuating interest rates over the short term. And another risk is that they're exposed to fluctuation in foreign currency because they operate in many different countries. Uh, they are exposed to the fluctuation of currencies. The way that they mitigate against this is they have 65% of all their holdings in the US dollar or in the Euro, which are two of the most stable currencies in the whole world. All right, so here you can see uh, their asset base. Um, so currently a majority of their, or not a majority, but a very large portion of their portfolio um, is in hydro, um, followed by wind, solar, um, diesel gas generation, which they're phasing out, and storage. Uh, currently, they're planning to to grow their implementation of solar uh, as well as storage through investments in solar plus storage facilities, um, and uh, phasing out hydro over time. But no new investments in hydro. So here you can basically see a map um, of where they operate. So in North America, they produce you know nine thousand four hundred megawatts of power. In South America, about half that, and in Asia, uh, just about a tenth of that. Uh, in Europe, uh, also about a half of that. Um, so they have $52 billion uh, in assets. Um, they, they have 5 million homes powered by clean energy, which is really impressive. A 19,000 megawatt hour portfolio, um, which is industry leading, 5,274 renewable power facilities. Um, they operate in 17 countries, like Isaac said. So to give a, a, an outlook on the entire renewable energy industry with a focus on solar power and wind, uh, Brookfield intends over the next 10 years to transform their portfolio into being the majority of solar and a smaller majority of wind and really phase out their hydro portion. So to focus on the solar power industry and the hydro, uh, or sorry, the, the wind power industry, Solar power industry has been growing extremely rapidly, as you can see from 2015 to 2020. It had a compound annual growth rate of 24%. And over the next five years, there's a projected annual growth rate of 16%. And as we see uh, a greater reliance on um, states passing renewable portfolio standards, um, which will require state energy to be sourced largely from renewable energy, we're gonna see a much larger um, growth within this industry over the next 10 years. Currently, only 29 states have mandated renewable portfolio standards. And of these 29, 13 
states and 200 cities have committed to achieve 100% clean energy targets. And most of these targets are anywhere from 2035 to 2050. And so what we see right now is in states, they're more in a transition stage. Um, but as this transition stage ends and the growth phase within states begins, we're gonna see a large increase of uh, production and a reduction of costs. And the wind industry also has a large growth rate, not as high as solar. Over the last five years, it grew by 10.3%, and there's an expected growth rate over the next five years of a little over 4.5%. The place in this industry that's gonna see the largest growth is in offshore wind development, which will allow for much larger wind turbines, which will produce exponentially more wind power and will also bring down the cost of their electricity. Currently, the United States has 4,100 gigawatts of potential offshore wind power capacity, which is 70 times more than their current installed wind power capacity. All right, so for some of the risks, mitigation, and ESG influence um, regarding Brookfield, uh, one of the big things, so the supply and demand in the energy market is volatile, um, and that can adversely affect electricity prices. Um, to their benefit, though, they're locked in uh, long, media, uh, in long, medium, and long-term contracts, um, which is beneficial to them. So like I previously said, um, a lot of their revenues are guaranteed over a 15 to 30 period time. Um, interest rate risk uh, is another issue. Um, however, floating rates make a very small percentage of their portfolio. Um, so there's low debt risk. And uh, advances in technology could impair or eliminate the competitive advantages of their projects. Um, however, they're committed um, to investing a significant amount of capital in future years into new technologies, including new solar plus storage facilities, which will help mitigate this risk. Um, and some of the ESG influence here, um, which is big for a lot of the financing of their projects, uh, they could benefit from a lot of tax credits, uh, the ITC and the PTC. Um, they're also able to get financing from not only debt, but also from tax equity. Um, and that's due to their, their nature of their business being in renewable energy generation. Um, and companies in the non-renewable energy industry, they're going to be moving into the space anyways, and they're going to be beginning to invest in the space as well moving forwards. For our ESG analysis here, um, some of the factors. So Brookfield's committed to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions uh, significantly. Currently, I believe they've decreased by, yeah, they remove... 27 million tons of carbon from the atmosphere annually, um, which is pretty significant. A uh, big thing too is they're involved in large community engagement projects and philanthropy projects in the areas they involve. For example, uh, in Colombia, where their dams are, they're building fish projects, they're building, um, they're rebuilding waterways in the areas that they've operated. Um, and also they have a, a very diversified board, which we'll go over on the next slide. Um, which is really important. So there's uh, a lot of diversity of thought within the company. Um, for some of the data we got, so we were not able to, or at least MSCI was not able to give us a rating on Brookfield Renewable Partners. However, their holding company, Brookfield Asset Management, uh, has a pretty good rating of an A, um, which is pretty positive. Um, and out of the, um, in their industry, in the utilities group, they're in the top uh, 35, uh, which is pretty impressive. For the SDGs that we're mapping to them, uh, is number seven, affordable and clean energy, 11, sustainable cities and communities, and 13, climate action. So they offer solutions to support decarbonization of the world, um, mainly through their energy generation uh, portfolio. And also they have plenty of projects uh, like planting trees, um, water uh, restoration, environmental restoration, et cetera. A lot of that's going on in some of the uh, uh, outside of the U.S. Uh, in South America, they're doing a lot of that. Um, they had, they're making efforts to measure, reduce, and avoid their emissions. Um, like I said, they avoided uh, just over 27 million tons of CO2 in 2019. And they conduct climate change risk assessments on all their projects. Um, and they have a team, uh, a sustainability team that comes in on all their projects. Uh, and they do a full analysis on uh, everything they do to weigh the uh, environmental and social impacts of where they operate and what they do. Um, on a social aspect, um, they're committed to anti-slavery and human trafficking policies, uh, especially in some of the third world countries they operate. Um, they strive to keep a positive workforce 
uh, environment and a safe environment too. Uh, on average, their employees uh, receive annually 31 hours of health and safety training, uh, which is pretty high. And also, they a lot of their projects, they're bringing in contractors to build these facilities. Um, and they have uh, responsible criteria for that. Uh, one of the big ones is they prioritize hiring unionized employees, um, which is beneficial to, uh, to the people they hire. Uh, in terms of governance, 40% uh, of their executive team is made up of women, 29% of the board is women, and 33% of the independent board directors are also women. So as we all know, recently COVID has had a large impact on every industry. Uh, to give a brief overview of COVID's impact on the energy industry and more specifically about the impact that it's had on Brookfield, um, a statistic is that Woodmac estimated that U.S. solar installations would decline by 18% in 2020 as a result of COVID. However, the majority of this 18% is contributed to residential demand, which they projected would drop 40%. This doesn't impact Brookfield uh, because 95% of the energy that they operate is at utility or industrial scale. So they're really not doing any residential operations. Um, the opportunities that are created by COVID for Brookfield uh, come in in the mergers and acquisitions, which is created by smaller developers struggling while larger developers are less affected. And in a post COVID-19 world, the desire for individuals to have independent uh, energy independence is only gonna increase which is gonna be a positive for Brookfield. And in Brookfield's Q2 report, they stated that they haven't seen any material impact as a result of COVID. From the graph on the right, you can see that the blue line represents the Q1 projections for 2020 to 2021 of solar installations. And then the orange line represents the uh, coronavirus impact and the adjusted uh, analysis on 20 to 2021. And you can see that the only year that's really affected is 20, but as we go into 2021, it's really rebounded back to the pre-COVID uh, analysis uh, projection. All right, so for our analyst ratings here uh, from Bloomberg, so currently the, the stock's actually trading uh, at a premium. It's pretty expensive right now um, compared to its intrinsic value. Um, but so these ratings are based on a 12 month basis. Our investment horizon is three to five years. Uh, we believe in the future success uh, of Brookfield, um, but it is important to note where the stock price currently stands uh, as it is close to its current 52 week range. Um, but you know, there's no sell rating, so it's, it's a pretty strong hold, uh, which is positive, which, you know, we'll hold it for the next year, but three to five realistically. Um, so here we have some comparable companies here. Um, including First Energy, TransAlta, Northland Power, Capital Power here. Um, some of the good, uh, the good numbers here, they're not debt to EBITDA. Uh, it's right on with their peers. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not too levered. You can also see that by their financial leverage ratio, which is good. Their return on invested capital um, is, you know, just above the median, uh, which means they get good returns on their projects. Um, that's based on the nature of the contracts um, that they get from those. Um, also, uh, the current ratio uh, of 0.88, which isn't on here, but uh, it was an extension of it, uh, is pretty good, which means they're able to, uh, to meet a bunch of their uh, responsibilities. Um, yeah, so that's the comps. For our price target, we'll move into the DCF. So for our bear case, uh, it was $47, being a 15% downside. Um, so the revenue growth for the company, uh, we put it about 10%, uh, which is slightly below the five-year average and also just below um, the competitors. Um, we also kept the, uh, the cost of goods sold constant, and that I'll explain how we changed that um, in the other cases and some of the other expenses like SG&A. Um, for our base case, uh, we, we did minor growth at about 12 to 13%, um, which is just above uh, some of the previous years. Uh, and we believe that's because um, their commitment to these new projects, uh, which will be coming on launch uh, in the next few years, um, and we'll start to create um, a lot more revenue for them. Um, and then for the bull case, uh, we had a high revenue growth and increased uh, perpetual growth rate uh, just because we believed that through future acquisitions, if they continue to make acquisitions in the solar space, 
um, they'll continue to grow their revenue significantly. Also, by doing that, um, they'll be able to realize synergies by acquiring uh, other companies, and therefore they'll reduce their cost of generation for their power. Uh, and in addition to that as well, um, that actually also accounts for the decrease in the cost of uh, photovoltaic panels and the decrease in the cost of onshore and offshore wind uh, facilities. So here for our DCF here, um, basically, so we came out um, for this base case, 10% upside. Um, I kind of just explained what we did. Um, and then you can just see how we got down to our, um, our market value, down to our equity value per share, about 60 for our base case. Um, and then, so in conclusion, uh, Brookfield, you know, they have a diversified portfolio of renewable energy assets that generate consistent cash flows. Um, their move towards acquiring more solar projects and wind projects um, is going to be a big shift for them. Uh, it's going to bring them into the future. Uh, a big thing about a company like Brookfield um, is that they're, they're highly insulated from economic cyclicality. Energy demand stays relatively consistent across all industries, um, whether in an economic uh, boom or recession. Um, and then some 95% of their solar generation too is contracted with public power utilities and industrial users, um, which is very strong uh, base that doesn't really ch change very much. And so state renewable portfolio standards as well as investment tax credits are really going to drive this industry over the next five to 10 years. Uh, a really important thing about renewable energy is that as production increases, costs decrease. So as we see states passing these renewable portfolio standards and utility scale renewable energy starts to exist in more states, the price of energy is going to decrease, which is going to increase the margins for companies like Brookfield. Uh, they also recently merged with Terraform Energy. Uh, Terraform Power was one of the largest owners of Sobel, solar globally. Uh, and they acquired them in 2019. And they've realized a 35% annualized total return as a result of this acquisition. And a second acquisition that they had, as I mentioned earlier, is their 1.2 gigawatt solar development project in Brazil, which is one of the largest in the world. Um, and over the last five years, if you look at the stock return, it's returned 130%. So overall, we feel like this is a really solid investment that will eventually um, show higher margins, uh, really large growth over the next five to 10 years, um, all while maintaining really predictable cash flows that can be projected out from 15 to 30 years. All right, guys, and that is uh, Brookfield Renewable Partners. Uh, we're open to questions now. Hey guys, thanks for the pitch. That was really good. Um, looks like you definitely found some some cool tips, some good tailwinds. I really like the the point out the fixed rate financing. I think that's definitely a good um, detail to note um, for sure because that helps mitigate risk. Um, and obviously, that being a pretty larger play, um, scooping up smaller um, renewable companies is definitely going to be big as as you guys kind of mentioned. So that's all good. Um, one thing I wanted to ask though, is there anything specific in terms of competitive advantages that they have over com um, competitors or is it just kind of the riding the tailwinds of um, solar energy and uh, just renew renewables in general and um, uh, the government's basically promoting that? Well, let's say one of the big things is their existing install base uh, is pretty large. Um, in the areas that they operate in, they're, they have tons of contracts um, with tons of large companies, um, as well as municipalities and states. Those are long term, so they kind of have a good hold on the market in that sense. Um, Isaac, do you got anything? Yeah, to add to that, in the renewable energy capacity matters a lot. Uh, Brookfield is one of the largest pure play renewable energy companies. And as a result of having a massive portfolio, they're able to have slightly higher margins than, than their competitors who don't hold as large of portfolios. Um, as I mentioned, as production increases within their portfolio, the uh, costs actually decrease. There's a direct correlation between the two. And so when you look at margins of their competitors, they're not as high as Brookfield because they just don't have the capacity to, to bring down costs. That's what I thought. Okay, yeah. So them being big definitely helps them. Cool. 
Yeah, I have a question. Um, great pitch. Um, so in terms of solar, I know that it's a very big part of the company's portfolio. Um, I know that at least in the past couple of months, I've read a couple of articles that one of the main things with solar is what happens after the actual panels become obsolete. I know that, that actually leaves a very big um, global footprint or carbon footprint. So I just want to know if, um, is there any strategy that Brookfield is trying to implement in terms of the actual uh, disposal of these um, unusable or basically like these solar panels that become obsolete after a while? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So uh, they're committed to actually uh, recycling majority of their used PV panels. Uh, and they have a facility in India, actually, where they recycle those. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I just have one last one. Uh, I know that you mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, that you said that most of their reserves are actually in, in dollars and the euro. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's about yes. 60%. Yes. So uh, I just wanted to ask, um, what, I mean, what is the, is the, has the company disclosed at least like how they're going to mitigate like exchange rate risk? I know that um, the euro is essentially a constantly weakening currency and the dollar, as of right now, it's starting to rise up. It's becoming stronger. So um, has Brookfield said anything about how they're going to mitigate that risk of obviously the euro constantly uh, weakening? And obviously as Europe tries to get out of this pandemic, just as we are, um, has they, have, have they disclosed anything about that? Yeah, so what they've said about that is that they've actually entered into foreign currency contracts. Um, so like longer term contracts to, to lock in an exchange rate to minimize their exposure to, to the fluctuation of foreign currencies. Um, and then on top of that, as you said, like 35% of all their cash flows are uh, in the US dollar. Um, and the Canadian dollar and the euro represent a little uh, under 30. So it's not just the euro, it's also the Canadian dollar. Um, they also, they, they have inflation linked escalations in their PPAs and their power purchasing agreements, which really hedges against um, the foreign currency contracts that they have in South America and Asian countries. Perfect. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, honestly, you might have hit on it. I might have missed it. But I know you guys had that really great graph showing kind of the locations and, and where they are and kind of their um, exposure to different countries. So what is their biggest focus and like where are they focusing on the most going forward in terms of like continents? Yeah, currently their biggest focus in their install base uh, by over 50% larger than the second greatest is North America. Um, they are interested though in moving into some solar projects. Like they recently are, are planning to do a solar project in Brazil as well. Um, I think as you know a little more about that Brazil one, right? Yeah, so as Max said, you know, about 30 billion of their assets are in North America compared to their second largest, which is Europe, which is a little over 10 billion. Um, and then South America is also their third largest portfolio. They just bought 2.1 gigawatt portfolio of solar energy in, in Brazil, which is one of the largest in the world. But I mean, North America is really their focus over the next 10 years. I think that a large portion of their hydropower right now is in South America, which is why it represents um, the third largest portion of the portfolio. But as they've said, they're going to try to uh, divest from hydro and, and look at more solar and, and wind power, which is going to lead them to a lot more investment in North America and Europe. Great. Thank you. So I'm just looking a little bit more into this company and facts that right now, and it says it was founded in September, 2019. I don't know if I'm looking at the right one, but I was just wondering what historical data 
you use to drive it? Are you looking at uh, BEP-US? Because there are a couple different ones. Okay, yeah, maybe I was looking at the wrong one. <laughs> Which one is this one? That said, it's BEP-US. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and they've been around for a long time, so we just pulled their financials, the historical. Yeah, I, that answers my question. I was just yeah. looking at the BECP. And Max and made the that, same mistake, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, if no one has any other questions, or if you do have any other questions, um, feel free to email either of them. Um, also, you could post them in the channel under the um, under their team's channel. And Sasha just put in the chat the link to the survey. But again, it's going to be open till Sunday. So she's also going to put the link in the general body channel. Um, and then there'll also be a link to the recording of this if you want to rewatch it. Their um, presentation is also in Microsoft Teams. Um, so like everything will be available to you if you want to look at it. I think your model's in there too, right? I'm like pretty sure I looked at that. Um, so the model should be in there as well if you want to like actually do a deeper dive into that as well. Um, so it's all available to you and we'll send a reminder. We'll pr I'll probably honestly send like a calendar invite reminder just to get the survey in um, by Sunday. But thanks, Max, Isaac, you did a great job. Um, everyone else, I appreciate all your questions. And if there's nothing else, you guys are free to go for the day. Um, I, don't, I don't think that link works. I just tried it out. Oh, yeah, really? I was about to say the same thing. It doesn't work? It says uh, invalid dynamic link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me try it again. It works for me. Weird. Um. Okay. Well, it's a different link. That one I think the I think the first link works. You just have so there's this little dot at the after a. If you just remove that, it should work. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize I added a dot. You can use either or though. It, it should all go to the same place. So, does is it okay for everyone now? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great. Um, and again, that will be in Teams too if you didn't copy and paste it or like use it already. But okay, great. Um, well, there's nothing else. Again, thanks to everyone for coming and we'll see you next week for the tech and healthcare. Oh, and then also don't forget to go to the sector meetings this week too. All right, thanks.